Welcome to Activate with Pastor Christian Newsom, a podcast of Journey Church International. Thank you for listening to the Activate Podcast with Pastor Christian Newsom, a ministry resource of Journey Church International. My name is Alex, and I'm honored to serve on the ministry team here at Journey. This Sunday was message 10 of 16 in our current series called Jesus People. In this series, we are focusing on nine spiritual realizations of Matthew chapters 9 through 11. This week's message was entitled, When I Need Faith to Have Faith. I'd like to welcome and thank each and every one of you uh, that have joined us and tuned in to listen to this conversation today. If by chance you missed this week's message, you can check it out on our website at takethejourney.cc, the JCI app, or on our YouTube channel. People tune in every week to the podcast for practical ideas on growing in their faith. And our hope is just that, that through this conversation, Jesus would speak something directly to your heart. Pastor Christian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And it's good to have you. So you've done this before. I have. But not while we've been YouTubing. So now our audience, we've described you as the bearded (laughs) worship leader without tattoos. Yeah. But now they can kind of really see your face. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not usually in front of the camera. So it, there's yeah. just, that's why I asked you, like, are we just having a conversation? You're like, yeah, it's a Kinda, podcast. Yeah. We're just, but our YouTube audience will watch, which means there's a chance that <laughs> six or seven new people might yeah. see who you are and yeah. <laughs> know, yeah. know what's going usually on in your I'm, world. I'm behind the camera. So that's this right. Is, this is, this that's is right. interesting. But yes. thanks for. So I should say to host. you, welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Here I am. Yeah. I'm, am I the guest? Are you asking me that's questions? That's a good, that's a good, no. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I can. No, I, I, yeah. I think we should go with the normal. All right. Let's All see right. that. We got it. So I wanted to start our conversation off today by talking about the ministry opportunity you had last week. Yep. Um, for those of you that don't know, Journey has a church ministry partner in Atlanta, Georgia called Hope Church Johns Creek. Pastor Christian, could you talk a little bit about our relationship with with Hope Church and then how we've been able to partner with them in their ministry efforts in Atlanta? So Pastor Chris Renfro started in my student ministry when he was 14. Mm. So he's 32. So when I got up to uh, talk to their church, I, you know, I told him, I said that. So I have known your pastor longer than anyone mm-hmm. in the room, including his wife. Mm-hmm. And when he was 14 years old, Chris uh, loved Jesus. He loved people. He loved the word of God and he felt like God had called him to like combine those three things in his life to figure out how to love God, love people and teach Mm. the word of God. So I've been hanging out with Chris and doing, Chris was a student pastor for nearly a decade doing discipleship now weekends, doing youth camp stuff with him, just being a friend and mentor when he was in town. And a couple years ago, God really began to just give him the urge to pastor and I began to speak to him about planting uh, a new work in the church that he was at in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, around the same time, began to develop a heart uh, to send some of their people out and some of their staff out to plant churches. So they actually started having Sunday services in the spring of 2021. In April, they've had 45. I, I was week 45 of Sunday morning services. They kind of launched publicly in August, uh, and they've just kind of started a new work that that has a a similar heart to journey when it comes to being a church that plants new churches, being a church that has community impact, being a church that believes in global impact, being a church that believes in spiritual growth. Uh, I think their mission statement is to make and send out Mm -hmm. disciples. Um, And they're, you know, they're, it's, it was unique. Um, I told Danielle I left and it took me back to some of the early months of our church and church planners literally are crazy. I mean, they're just crazy. Like he has no idea like how close he is to like not being a church. Like I remember those early days when we would have 15 people and 40 people and 60 people. And in my heart, it was always going to work. And And I remember Danielle, like from an outsider's perspective, just like saying like, man, I don't know. For the first time I saw why she saw that because Chris was just gangbusters over what was happening, as was his team, like all early church planners were. Um, But I texted Pastor Mike Evans, who also planted a church in Lee Summit around the same time we did. And I just said, man, what were we thinking? Like (laughs) to, to begin having services with like less than 100 people and just believe and trust God that it's going to work like Mm -hmm. the crazy faith that God must have given us 11 years ago to start. It was neat to kind of relive some of those moments, relive some of those memories and have conversations with his launch team. Sure. There's some people, um, 
I mean, who will just never experience journey as it was when it was just a few dozen of us. But those people who have seen it become what it has become, like I told them, like, just get ready to enjoy the ride because God will do immeasurably more yeah. than you could ask or imagine if you'll stay faithful and if you'll fight through fatigue. We were able to do a volunteer training at the very end and be able to do a Q&A with kind of his top 50 or 60 volunteers. And it was just neat to share what God has been doing at Journey and what they can what they can look forward to. Yeah. So super proud of Chris and his wife, Catherine, and just praying for his, you know, his, uh, his kids, Isaac and Ava, as, as they continue to lean into this new work and, and, uh, and grow from being a church plant into a planted church yeah. and that community have an impact. So it has to be interesting. This isn't a question I was planning on asking you, but just since you're talking about church planting, I, I'm sure reliving those emotions probably brought also emotions of doubt that you experienced too. So did you, did you know, knowing that you were getting ready to preach the message that you preached this weekend about doubt, were you able to preach anything and speak in, any life into them knowing that they're at the spot that they are? So I talked to, I talked to not, a, not about doubt specifically, hmm. but one of the volunteers asked questions like what, what, um, what kills church plants? Yeah. Like as you've watched churches plant over the past decade and, and don't make it, what is the thing? And I just told him, um, you've got to be willing to fight fatigue, yeah. like because you're gonna get you're gonna get tired hmm. before you get help. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> help is coming, wow. but you'll be tired first. And I said you got to stay on mission, and you got to set because when it just becomes about having church mm -hmm. and not fulfilling the mission, it can just get real old yeah. real fast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we j just got to talk to him about sharing stories, reaching friends. One of the real unique things that our church had when. When we were like at a hundred mm -hmm. people and all of them were volunteers, I think one of the things that made our church unique is almost all 100 had a friend, family member, coworker, neighbor who came and got saved. Wow. And they were no longer showing up on Sunday morning for journey. They were showing up for their friend yeah. who just became a Christian and wow. they did not want them to have a bad experience. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, so I told their volunteers, I said, when you get a friend who doesn't know Jesus, who comes to this church and starts following Jesus, it will change everything about how you serve. Because mm. you serve one way when you think you're serving the organization. Mm. When you know your friends are coming, you get there a little earlier, you have a little more critical eye, mm. you have a little more energy in your spirit. So I said, for your church to be on mission long term, you have to be on mission right now, wow. doing the work of the ministry. And I think that struck a nerve of them thinking, man, we... We've been doing this for others. How long can we keep doing this for others? And it's like, no, you need to do this for your own people because yeah. that'll, that'll change everything. It's a game changer. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, so this week in message number 10 of 16, uh, the series, again, is called Jesus People, um, Nine Spiritual Realizations of Matthew 9 through 11. Um, I wanted to point out that we've been in the book of Matthew as a church for much longer than just 10 weeks, though. Fall of 2020, yep. This question, we could probably spend 30 minutes talking about the answer sure. that you're about to give, but for some of our newer lis listeners, could you summarize a, a couple of things? Why did we decide to spend so much time in Matthew, okay. sp and specifically Matthew? Give us a bit of a summary on what we've learned so far, and then what's to come for our church. Do you think you could answer that question that you just asked me? In front of a camera with a microphone in front of me. Just do you think you know? <laughs> do you think you know the answer to that question? Because I bet you don't. Um, why have is, Why have we been in Matthew so long? I bet you couldn't answer that question. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I could. So we do our sermon planning about a year in advance. Mm -hmm. In coming into 2020, the COVID year, mm -hmm. I had done all of my sermon planning in the fall of 2019 for 2020, and at that time we were very topical. Mm -hmm. in our sermon series orientation, which yeah. meant we thought about topics that needed to be addressed in order to disciple our people well to live in the world that we were living in. And then we would shape series around those topics and wrap the biblical truth around that. That's just kind of how we were doing church mm -hmm. in 2020. And we had seen it be productive in discipling our people and, and keeping them living on mission. And that's, that's one great way that a lot of great churches do great ministry. Mm -hmm. One of the series that we were going to do was a series on the Sermon on the Mount mm. in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Of course, COVID comes in and interrupts, the, it turns the world upside down, right? Sure. And as we started kind of very, very slowly having our church return in the summer of 2020, and we started looking at that Sermon on the Mount series, one, we had a totally different church in the fall of 2020 than we did in the fall of 2019. We just had passionate, hungry, 
gritty Christians who were willing to do whatever to be in church. Mm -hmm. Wear a mask, whatever, six six feet away, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Come early, stay late, go to some, like what, like they were willing to do whatever it took to be in church because they wanted to worship and they wanted to hear the word of God. And we just said, you know what? It might be time to make a hard shift in our church. What if we started in Matthew 5 and we just threw all the future series away and we just said, we're just going to stay in Matthew till we're done. Yeah. That is when we made that decision. Summer of 2020, when we looked at just a couple hundred people in our church yeah. doing whatever the government said they had to do to be in church because they wanted to be in church because they wanted to hear the word of God and they wanted to worship with community. Yeah. That crowd just kind of convinced us to just go deep verse by verse with Jesus together. And we really made a hard shift. And that is why Mm. we've ended up spending so much time. I think we were going to do a six week series Mm. in the Sermon on the Mount. We ended up doing a 35 week series in the Sermon on the Mount because we just said, we're just going to teach it until it's over. Yeah. Yeah. We just sit in until it's over. And then we went to Matthew chapter eight, spent another six weeks on faith. Mm -hmm. Then at Christmas time, we backed in actually to Matthew chapter one and two, Mm -hmm. pulled some Christmas stuff out. Uh, and then after kicking off our new year, real vision heavy, mm-hmm. we jumped right back into Matthew chapter nine and said, let's keep going. And I announced today that we'll start the Sunday after Easter, a new series called The Kingdom, yeah. which will take us 13 through 17. But I don't envision us finishing the book of Matthew until sometime in 2024, which means we'll have spent <laughs> five years Literally. in it, yeah. but really driven by people who uh, were unwilling to let obstacles Mm-hmm. keep them from coming to church to study God's word together. They mm-hmm. so inspired us. We were like, let's just study let's it just deeper it. than we've ever studied it before. It's good. Yeah. So we, yeah. So we spent a lot yeah. of time in the Sermon on the Mount. Then Matthew 8 was lessons in faith. And now Matthew 9 are these realizations that we walk through. And then mm-hmm. in the spring, late spring and summer, uh, we'll be in the kingdom. Yeah. Just talking about the kingdom of God. I'm very excited Yeah, for the kingdom. That's awesome. So the main topic of this could you have answered that question? Uh, not that eloquent. Yeah, I don't know. No. Well, I'm not. El- <laughs> I bet you didn't know that information because that wasn't something we shared publicly no. as we made the hard shift away from our topical sermon series to just let's just go yeah. verse by verse. When when my wife Katie and I first came to Journey, we, we were kind of in that very topical right. thing. I think the first sermon series, if I think back, that we experienced would have been Grim Reaper. Okay, I think you were talking about good suffering one. and yep. stuff. But yeah, then then COVID hit, and then like yep. the whole concept just changed. So so that's right. that's really interesting. Just yep. how, how we're just literally sitting in the gospel. It's so cool. Yep. So cool. So this week's message um, was specifically kind of about doubt and the concept right. of doubt. And you referred to the passage in Mark uh, 9, verse 24, where yeah. we see a prayer that, that honestly, we should probably make more of a regular part of our, all of our lives as Christians. Um, and the verse goes, um, I do believe, but help me uh, overcome my unbelief. Right. One could probably also pray that prayer maybe in this way. Jesus, I've seen your work in my life. Help me to defend against the doubt that can so easily sneak into my thought life. That happens to me and and probably all Christians deal with that some in in, in some way. So through the lens of spiritual warfare, why is it so important to ask Jesus regularly to help us in this area? Well, it's interesting how how many of the weapons of our warfare protect our heart and our mind like really the so the first piece of spiritual truth is the or spiritual armor is the belt of truth Mm -hmm. right that's gonna that's gonna pull your whole life like the truth is gonna pull your whole life together which means the lies are gonna try to pull your life apart the breastplate of righteousness is gonna protect your heart understanding that jesus and what he did for you matters most Mm -hmm. doubt will make you question jesus and what is going on around you Mm -hmm. most i mean you could just pick it apart the shoes that are that that are fitted with peace that comes from the gospel of peace and satan who wants to bring anxiety in everything that you have Mm -hmm. um the shield of faith which is believing the things that are unseen as if they're real Mm -hmm. paul who would say we walk by faith and not sight, mm-hmm. um, the helmet of salvation that guards, you know, our, our heads and our thought life, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the the word of God back back to truth again, and then prayer, which literally is the friendship relationship part of hey, stay real close to Jesus, run everything mm-hmm. by Him. Um, I think one of Satan's greatest tools is doubt, yeah, but I think one of God's most powerful tools is doubt. <laughs> Because if we handle doubt like John the Baptist, Mm -hmm. if we take our doubt to Jesus, 
rather than deny it. It's why I had that prayer from Mark chapter 9. The power of this father to speak his unbelief. Mm -hmm. Do you believe? He's like, yes, but... But it's hard. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. and maybe not in this area. Mm -hmm. Like he was... like. He brought his kid to Jesus and like, can you heal? Him? If you can do anything, help him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Jesus said, what do you mean if? Yeah. All things are possible to him who believes. Yeah. And he's like, I do believe. Help me overcome my own belief because the if in my story right now is either going to bring me closer to Jesus or take me further from Jesus. And I think if people can figure out how to state the if in their story... What is your unbelief? What is your doubt? What are the things you're struggling with? If you can state the question, you can begin to find the answer. Yeah. If Satan can keep it vague, if he can mm-hmm. keep it a feeling rather than a question, yeah. then there may be no answers. But if you can turn your unbelief or your doubt into a question, mm-hmm. then there is a belt of truth. Mm-hmm. Then there is a breastplate of right. There are things that can wrap and protect that thought spiritually in your life. But you got to be willing to state your unbelief. This father stated his unbelief. He was not judged for it. Hmm. It allowed Jesus to work in his life. John the Baptist, I feel like, was stating his doubt when he was Mm -hmm. like, hey, we're we're still on the right track, right? Because it feels like things are off a little bit. That allowed Jesus to do more ministry immediately in the eyes of his disciples. Mm -hmm. In Matthew, the text we read in Matthew 11 Jesus, like, tell John, blind, see, all this stuff. In Luke chapter 7, uh, in Matthew 11, we read that. In Luke chapter 7, when they asked Jesus, are you the guy? Jesus did all that ministry. Mm-hmm. He's like, watch this. Did all, and he's like, go tell John what I just did. <laughs> so bringing doubt to Jesus actually spurred Jesus to do ministry that everyone could see clearly. Wow. So I think we've, we've got to see, it, and it's the realization. As a Jesus follower, doubt's real. That's okay. Yeah. If you bring it to Jesus, Mm -hmm. it will deepen your faith. It's dangerous if you let it keep you away from Jesus. So we just we just gotta we gotta handle it the right way. Yeah. Hmm. In the daily reflection that you give, um, so typically you give one for each each of the days of the week, and for Thursday this week, you you ask us to do that. So to identify maybe an unbelief that we're experiencing. And and I love what you ask. It's, it says, would you be willing to talk to someone in your spiritual community this week about that unbelief? Yeah. What part does accountability play in the help me with my unbelief prayer and specifically the accountability that tends to come with that spiritual community? So I think, so I don't know that accountability is, is the right word. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of times saying stuff out loud Mm -hmm. has powerful, spiritual influence yeah. right it's interesting that god spoke the world into existence hmm. god spoke the ten commandments mm-hmm. um it says in the book of revelation that when jesus comes with his armies of heaven he will open his mouth and the sword that comes from his spoken word will demolish the enemy mm-hmm. there's something powerful about speaking truth i don't know if you remember when the barracks were here yeah. and they said that you know brain doctors have said your brain believes what your what you mouth say. says yeah. out loud yeah. so i think par- partly just acknowledging i think it's really sharing a burden more than it is being accountable mm-hmm. i think part of saying out loud what your unbelief is mm-hmm. part of hearing it is like i don't even think i believe that i don't even yeah. think i believe that yeah. Um, but I, so I think part of saying it out loud is really unloading a burden, Mm -hmm. but I think just being able to, to share life experience with people. Like, so I, so I had a conversation with a gal after the service today. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned the Joplin tornado that we went to go serve and clean up in. So three days after the Joplin tornado, she lived in Sedalia. Her house was destroyed by a tornado. And she said the silver lining of it changed their life. And she said, you know, you you were talking about your doubt And like, there's not a verse for this. And she said, I could give you dozens of ways that God worked through a tornado, (laughs) literally destroying our house six weeks before they would have their first baby. She's like almost eight months pregnant when the tornado hits her house. The same week the tornado hit Joplin. Hmm. Part of stating your doubt out loud is for someone else to say, you know what? I went through that exact thing and I had that doubt. But a decade later, let me show you how all that's worked. So I think part of inviting people into your doubt is inviting their story and their faith to be the bridge 
that you need to cross to get to the next steps that you need to take. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's accountability as much as say, hold me accountable not to doubt yeah. as it is sharing a burden and borrowing someone else's faith. Yeah. Like some, hmm. like sometimes wow. you have to say, uh, I do not have enough faith to really probably love Jesus through this. So I'm going to borrow yours Yeah. because you're telling me, it's going to be okay. So I'm going to borrow your faith until I can have my own again, and which is kind of the thought of the message, right? To yeah. You got to have faith in your faith. Yeah. And that's a lot yep. easier to do if you invest in spiritual community. No right? doubt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So for so many people, I think it's easy to think, man, I wish I could get out of the circumstances that I'm in. Yep. Um, then, then I would be able to doubt less. Yep. And in reality, I think you taught that John the Baptist shows us that our perspective is completely backwards. In Matthew 11, he is literally sitting in prison, and rather than surrendering to all of the probably valid reasons that he should exist in doubt, he seeks Jesus. In reality, what we need to do is ask Jesus to step into this circumstance with us and not just right. run away. And then usually we realize that he, he's been there the whole time. Right. So what are some practical ways that we can mentally flip our mindset from the world to Jesus in those times where the world tells us that we should seek anything but Jesus? Yeah, so I think I think we need to I think we need to change our questions from what and when to why and how. Mm. Stop asking what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. When can I get out of here? Mm-hmm. And start asking how is God maybe trying to use this in my life? And why would Jesus allow me to be in this situation? What could possibly be coming in my future mm. that, he, that he would want me to have? Mm. Um, because we believe he's sovereign. We also believe he's good. Mm-hmm. We believe he's you know omnipresent, which is a theological word that means he's always with you. Yeah. We believe he's omniscient, which is uh, a way of saying that he's all-knowing. So we know he is aware of what we're going through and he's with us. So instead of asking him, um, you know, instead, like, so if you could picture Jesus, like you and I are talking, mm-hmm. instead of turning to him and saying, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. Which would seem to be kind of a disrespectful tone to take with Jesus, sure, you know, sure. or <laughs> when is this over? Yeah. Think about sitting in the situation with Jesus and saying, okay, um, why, why right now? Are you allowing me to live through this? Yeah. And then sit and listen. Mm-hmm. How could this situation make me better at knowing you or pointing people to you in the future? Mm. I think if you can change those questions, I mean, it, it's that it's that whole another in the fire yeah. concept, yeah. right? Yeah. That we sing. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you're like Jesus was in the fire with the people before they got out. It wasn't the rescue from the fire yeah. that changed them. It was the rescuer in the fire, in the fire. that changed them. Yeah. They weren't changed because they got out. They were changed because they realized he got in. Yeah. And if we could sit in that fire with Jesus mm-hmm. and just say, how, well, you know, why are we here right now? What do I, wh- why are we here? Why, why do you want me in this situation right now? You got my attention. How do you want to use this in me or for someone else? I think that changes the conversation and allows us to sit and pause and listen and reflect mm-hmm. and hear and hopefully see behind the spiritual veil a little bit of what's going on. If we could just calm down and ask those questions. Yeah. Wow. After watching what's unfolded this week in Ukraine across on the other side of the world, many, many people have a lot of reasons to let the noise of the world maybe fog their perspective yeah. spiritually and, and, and shift to probably an emotional stance of doubt. Um, because quite, quite often the world just is very loud with the, with the stuff that's going on. How can, how can Christians pray specifically in and for a situation like that that's unfolding before our very eyes? And I know this morning you gave, you gave the real world, we can right. help by helping the 25 families that you referenced this morning, but maybe for right. someone who doesn't have those resources to help in that way, right. how can we pray and be still an active church for that situation? Right. So I think sometimes God um, can use totally hopeless situations Hmm. to finally make us cry uncle. Hmm. Um, You're probably not old enough to have watched Popeye the Sailor Man cartoons, right? You don't even know. I know who Popeye is. Do you know who Popeye is? I've I've never watched it. So Popeye is this little skinny sailor man dating this little skinny sailor girl. I don't think she's a (laughs) sailor girl. Um, 
And he's always getting in fights with Brutus, who's just, you know, he kind of, Brutus kind of looks like you. He's kind of wow. a big guy with a beard. Is that a compliment? Um, yeah, 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 <laughs> Br- yeah, Brutus was a, yeah, Brutus was a, he was a big burly, he was a big burly guy. Um, and Popeye would get to the point where something would go wrong to the point where he would say, I can't stand it no more. Because mm. he would always talk with an S on, he had this little pipe that he smoked, yep. so I can't stand it no more. And he would eat spinach and he'd become like this like Samson, right? Yeah. And he'd get himself out yeah. of any situation that he was able to be in. There are a lot of people who think we don't need God. Hmm. We don't need Jesus. We don't need church. Yeah. And every now and then you look at a situation like this and you say, oh, so this is what a, this is what a godless world hmm. looks like to live in. And I think sometimes God can leverage these moments so that people have these Popeye moments where they think, I can't stand it no more. If this is what it looks like for evil people mm-hmm. to be able to do whatever they want, whenever they want, to whomever they want, yeah. somebody good and moral and powerful and upright should be in charge and do something about it. Yeah. And that's where the Christians, that's where Christians point to Jesus. Hmm. Because it's not just Vladimir Putin and 2022 um sin and brokenness Mm -hmm. and sinful and broken people have been hurting the world and the people in the world since the beginning of time and jesus is the rescuer who stepped into that when a group of people were helpless and said i am the good and powerful and moral and loving rescuer who can help you in this situation Mm -hmm. so i think even sometimes in the darkness the light shines the brightest i think as christians pray i think we need to pray very specifically for churches and christian universities i was actually reading an article that pastor mike sent me on saturday about the thriving christian universities and christian churches in ukraine Hmm. um, that probably will very quickly be shuttered Hmm. um if, if Russia would take over the nation of Ukraine. So I, I think, you know, like, like Fellowship Christian Athletes, it had this thriving community with 25 staff families yeah. who are leveraging sports to help people know who Jesus is. Mm-hmm. I think as we pray, we need, to pray for, uh, we need to pray for the Christian churches. We need to pray for the Christian universities. We need to pray for the people that are spreading the light of Jesus, that God will protect them, keep them safe. And, and somehow, if they were to be able to outlast this invasion and keep their country... Um, that people would flock to them for the for the hope of the gospel um, that they offer, uh, you know. And I and I think other than that, you know, trying to trying to figure out how tangibly you can help yeah. with food or clothes or mm-hmm. opening your home or anything else. There's there's going to be like we are experiencing um, a lot of refugees created through this process mm-hmm. that just need Jesus people to um, to be Jesus people. You know, and it might, might even reframe some of the conversation. There's, there's a lot of really good Jesus people um, who don't care as much for refugees sitting at our southern border right now as they do for refugees sitting at the Hungarian and, and Polish border right now. Yeah. They might just need to pause and think, okay, like nationally, you know, we, we may need to politically figure out how to do better in the area of immigration. But if you're just looking at humans people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we gotta figure out how to help people right i mean christians help people we gotta figure out how to how to help people and i you know i i don't know how to rewrite the immigration code but we got to figure out how to help people we got to care about people we got to see people not just problems yeah so i think i think part of this crisis allows us to see faces of people women and children running from oppressive regimes which is you know which is happening much closer to home than the ukrainian border Mm -hmm. yeah i uh I just want to thank you just for your heart, just with your, your heart for people, but also for, for helping people recognize that spiritual warfare is a real thing and then h- helping us defend against that. Because as a Christian, we know that it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, uh, but we go anyway. I mean, right. that's what you said right. the past couple of weeks. So just right. th- thank you for, for helping Christians yeah. figure that out because I think it's so important. Yeah. Got to live in the tension of that. Yeah. We got to learn how to, we got to learn to live better in the tension of the mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Pastor Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> <It's really good. laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for listening in today. Um, if this is your first time to the Activate podcast, we are just so happy that you're here. We hope you'll join us again for more biblical insights and ways to truly activate your faith. 
If you live in the Kansas City area, we would love to meet with you in person at one of our two weekend experiences, 845 and 1030 on Sunday mornings. If you are listening from outside the Kansas City area, you can tune in every week to one of our services online. If you have a question about your spiritual journey or a celebration you'd like to share about what God's doing in your life, email us at activate at takethejourney.cc. We would love to hear from you. We look forward to catching you next time on the Activate Podcast, where we challenge you to build a faith that is active. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Activate. We would love for you to join us in person for one of our weekly worship experiences. You can find out more information about JCI on our website at takethejourney.cc. Help us get the word out about this resource. You can do so by subscribing, reviewing, and sharing this episode on your favorite social media platform. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Activate Podcast.